So it's a couple of days past due. Please, oh please, forgive me. But better late than never. It's time for me to talk about NXT TakeOver Chicago 2. Yes, that's pretty blatant gimmick infringement. Sorry, Wrestling Jesus. All love for you. But I'm going to go where no other reviewer dares to go. And that is dare imply and get them ready, people. Get those flaming keyboard fingers of fire ready because you know you're going to want to flame away in the comments section when I sit there and insinuate that this might not have been the best NXT TakeOver show of all mother of time. I know, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? You hate my guts and everything. But Jesus Christ, just because a show is good, just because you enjoy it, doesn't mean you should always get so ridiculously caught up in the moment that every single time one of these shows happens, you're automatically referring to it as the greatest freaking show of all time. Because the simple truth of the matter is... Not every show, every time, because it's the next one, is going to be the greatest show of all time. It's like we've got a half million freaking mini melters running around the freaking internet with this crap. Give me a break. Let's talk about NXT TakeOver Chicago 2. A major advantage for these NXT TakeOver shows is that they only happen every couple of months. Another advantage is they're only a couple of hours long. For a guy that's kind of time challenged like me, it's very nice when you're getting ready to watch a show so you can review it and you only have to worry about devoting a couple of hours to it. You can either get it done in one straight shot or a couple of smaller straight shots. It's not one of these main roster pay-per-views that are four to five freaking hours. And all the matches have some type of purpose. All the matches are well planned out and choreographed. So it's a lot harder for these shows to suck. It is. So you got to keep that in mind. Uh, but the tag team championship match. It was a good, solid starter. Um, got a little too New Japan ROH flippy, kicky, no-selling, false finish bullshit for me. Uh, but unfortunately, that's just the business we have today. I will say, though, it's just felt like a couple of JAG teams facing each other. JAG teams, just another guy teams. Like, all four of these guys in the match felt like just another guy. The one guy that had any type of star appeal to him whatsoever involved in this match is the guy that didn't wrestle and the leader of the Undisputed Era, Adam Cole, whatever the fuck the Undisputed Era is supposed to be. But he's a guy that has enough of several different traits that I could see the company being able to trust in him to make some money for them in the future on the main roster. But he wasn't wrestling in the match. So inherently, I don't care as much. I thought Lorcan and Birch showed pretty well for themselves. If you're trying to put the team on the map, this was a good match to do it. And like I said, in general, it was a good way to kick off the show. Ricochet Velveteen Dream. I bet a lot of you probably enjoyed this. I'll be honest, I didn't enjoy this one as much. It was my least favorite match of the night. I look at Velveteen Dream and I see a legit talent. Patrick Clark is really damn good. He's got it. He gets it. He understands it. And he knows how to feel it. And more importantly, make the audience feel it. I will still always hate that fucking gimmick because just because he's a black wrestler, Vince Hunter, doesn't mean he needs to dance, rap, and or be all types of gender fluid and suspect. It's okay to have occasional characters like that, but they don't mostly all need to be like that. It's just, I hate that they took a real talent and saddled him with this, but because it's a real, he's a real talent, he makes it work. Uh, but to me, you want to take this to a whole nother level, pair him with a blonde, get him as Marlena type, and it would take his character to a whole nother level. Now, I look at Ricochet, and I see a guy with years of history on the independent scene all around the world, and the shit that he can do, he should be able to be a big star. And maybe when he's on the main roster someday, maybe they'll still be able to make some type of star out of him because he has a sizable following coming with him. But to me personally, a guy that didn't really pay much attention to him throughout the years... As he worked around the world, there's just too many other guys just like him. He does not stand out to me. The moves that he does, so many other guys do. I'm sorry, even if you say, well, he puts this variation on it, or he does this one or two things that are different. That's not enough. He's just another flippy, kicky, uh, non-storytelling dude in the ring. And we have our fill of them already, believe me. And personally, I just didn't think their styles meshed, meshed that well in this match. For my, for my taste, anyways. I feel like Velveteen Dream is much more character-driven, where Ricochet is much more spot-driven, and sometimes that contrast in styles can work. We say styles make fights. Uh, it did not make this fight here. I did not think this match was anything to write home about. 
especially when I saw, you know, several months back, Velveteen Dream versus Aleister Black. Now that was something to write home about. This one will be the most forgettable match on the show to me. I will tell you a match that I was surprised how much I enjoyed it and ended up being my pleasant surprise of the night was the NXT Championship, Nikki Cross, Shayna Baszler. I really enjoyed this match. I thought both women did the match the way they were supposed to, uh, fitting into their characters. They actually, again, bothered to tell a story. Uh, Shayna Baszler, I think, has gotten better. Um, seems like in some cases she gets more crap than she really deserves. I think she's improving and growing as a talent. And Nikki Cross plays that kind of uh, psycho bitch role very, very well. And what really made this match to me was the finish. This is a perfect example of how when you do a finish right, it makes the whole match work. When you do a finish right, both people come out better for it. I hate when I hear people talk about, oh, this match was outstanding, you had all of this happen, uh, the finish was a little lame and disappointing, but that's okay. No, it fucking isn't. Everything is building up to that moment. It is all about the finish. It is just like when you're hopping on the good foot and doing the bad thing, when you're in bed fucking. The foreplay can be amazing, but if the foreplay doesn't make you nut, and then you sit there and you go to chitty chitty bang bang sausage into biscuit mode, and you get right to that point, and all you get is just a little pre-cum, and that's it. That's not a good sex experience. That is bad. You didn't get your nut. And even then, there are different levels and variances of nuts. There's kind of like the sad, pathetic nut, the, okay, that was good. Oh my God, I felt that in my butthole that was so outstanding and not because, shut, shut the fuck up. You know what I mean? There are different levels and variances of it. But it's still about the finish. All that other stuff can be fine. But if you don't ultimately get yours, it sucked. And that's all you remember. And that's what wrestling is supposed to be. All that other stuff can be great and build up to it, but it is about the finish. And when you got Shayna Baszler as the dominant MMA girl, sitting there choking out Nikki Cross, so she's showing how powerful and dominant she is, and then you got Nikki Cross fighting and fighting and fighting, and then one last time she looks up and gives that shit-eating psycho bitch, put it in my butthole grin, and then she passes out. You've made both of them so much better as characters because Baszler just choked a bitch out and Nikki Cross refused to tap out. It's not that hard to figure out. Sometimes wrestling can be so maddeningly simple. I absolutely loved this finish and it really helped me enjoy the overall match again because the thing that mattered the most was the finish and the finish was really, really good. NXT Championship, Lars Sullivan, Aleister Black. I didn't know what I was going to get heading into this. Because I hadn't been exposed a lot to Lars Sullivan. And honestly, I haven't been that impressed. But again, I haven't had that much exposure to him. And the exposure I've gotten has been relatively limited at that. And as far as Aleister Black, like, I see it. I get why people like him. I think he's a good talent. I don't know if he's a great talent. But I do look at him and I see a guy that's pretty close to being roster ready. In terms of whoever he is, whatever he is, is pretty much what he is now. And whether it be the night after SummerSlam or some point in time here soon, I got to envision he's got to be ready for a jump up to the main level. And it either is or isn't going to be whatever it is or isn't going to be with him. Um, but this match, I got to say, Lars Sullivan impressed me. He absolutely needs to change his ring gear. I don't think that helps him whatsoever. It looked kind of ridiculous to me with the trunk. It just didn't work. But... I liked what I saw out of the dude. He showed me something as a big 300 plus pounder. He can move, he can do athletic shit, he's got some high impact stuff. Uh, he's a lot less limited than I remember him being. So there has definitely been growth and progression with him over the past few months and that's good to see. That's part of the purpose of an NXT is to help develop these talents and help get them better and get them main roster prepared. And when I was watching this NXT championship match, I saw two guys with some main roster potential. Now, what level that main roster potential is eh, remains to be seen. And ultimately, it doesn't matter what potential they do or don't have, because if Vince does or doesn't see it, it's all that matters, really. Uh, but the match was good. Um, had an iffy moment or two for me. Um, one thing that frustrates me, and it just frustrates me about wrestling now in general, 
is when Lars Sullivan goes down and chops Alistair Black's knee, like you're working the whole match around the concept and the story of Alistair Black trying to hit his finishing kick, and he goes and chops the knee out from under him, instead of Alistair Black selling it like you would sell it if you walked into the corner of a coffee table or a wall or something and hit your knee because that son of a bitch hurts, he gets right back up and he's doing shit again. It's like, no, god damn it. These guys feel like they're so pressured and forced and because it's scripted that way, they have to get their shit in that they do stuff they don't have to. They do stuff that isn't necessary. Sometimes, again, less is more. And it felt like at times that would have helped this match a little bit. But it was still good. It was not certainly the match of the night, but it also wasn't going to be the main event anyways. And like I said, the design of this was to... Uh, have Lars Sullivan come out of it smelling really well. It did that. And then we get to the main event. Johnny Gargano, Mr. Wrestling, versus Tommaso Ciampa. The Chicago Street Fight. And surely, if you didn't just have Okada and Omega, you'd be hearing about this being match of the year. I'm sure. I'm sure. Now here's what I will say. As somebody kind of from the outside looking in that doesn't watch NXT on a weekly basis, it pretty much only catches the takeover shows to kind of uh, keep up with what's going on. I appreciate that this story has played out for a long time. Maybe it should have already been done by now. Also, it feels like it's kind of weird to me to have the heel go over now when a storyline like this should be built around the baby face winning, and that should be the end of it. But what's so refreshing about this is Gargano is the clear-cut hero. Everybody's behind him. Everybody loves him. He's a true babyface. Tommaso Ciampa is hated. Everybody seems to hate him. He is an actual villain. He's a real deal heel, at least in NXT. And so often in today's wrestling, where everybody wants to be smart-ass Steven or something, and they want to cheer who they want to cheer and boo who they want to boo, regardless of whether or not it actually helps the person that they really like, by getting them over the right way or not because you just want to fucking do it anyways because we all want to play fantasy booker all the time with every goddamn match that's on TV or on pay-per-views or what have you. It's so refreshing when wrestling works the way it's best designed to work. You've got the guy to like, you've got the guy to hate. And these two guys in this program and the way they work their styles reminds me of old school wrestling. Now granted, you've got the newer style with the high impact crap, a lot of high spots and this and that. But I can get by some of that because there are storytelling elements and because you've got a clear-cut hero and a clear-cut villain. It's when you have some of those other things, you bring this other stuff in, it can help take that to another level. When it is just all of one or just all of the other, it just doesn't work as well. Um, I think the only thing I, I really didn't vibe with in terms of the street fight is the fact of part of the problem with having a show where you only have five matches is these matches can get a lot of time. And sometimes less is more, or more matches, less time for the matches could be the way to go. This went like 35 minutes. Personally, I feel like it could have went 15 or 20 and been just fine, if not even better. You would have avoided some of the slowdowns and some of the lulls and so forth. Just because you can go 35 minutes doesn't mean you shouldn't find a way to do it in 20 or no more than 25. And especially because it's a street fight. I envision a street fight where people are going balls to the walls after each other and there's no breaks and this and that. Like you're fighting almost to the death. And this didn't feel that extreme of a street fight, even with all the crazy shit they did, because it was just too long. And that affected my ability to enjoy the match a little bit. Still really good, still the match of the night, still love the dynamics of the clear-cut babyface and the clear-cut heel. See, sometimes we can find different ways to enjoy the same thing. Isn't that refreshing? And yet still, I will get flaming keyboard fingers of fire in the comments, and I know it. And that was NXT TakeOver Chicago number two. And again, I like the show. It helps when it's only two and a half hours. It helps when the match is actually a purpose and meaning, and you can easily relate to it. And you have a couple of pretty good matches on the card. It makes for an okay couple of hours of watching wrestling. Not everything has to be spectacular. Not everything has to be the greatest of all time. For me to still find some amusement and enjoyment out of it. And that's all I'm looking for now. And at least I can say that this NXT TakeOver show 
provided that for me. But greatest NXT takeover of all time, like that even means that much when they've only been doing them for a couple of years anyways. How many shows do you really have to compare it on? Is let's not get caught up in this bullshit Marcus trap of every time they do a show, it's the greatest crap of all time. We're going to start sounding like WWE shows. We're going to sound like WWE Meltzers here after a while. Let's pump the brakes on that just a little bit. But still a good night of wrestling. Anyways, I'm the Schleg Daddy. This is OTR Central. Remember, as the t-shirt says, that you should have bought if you haven't done so already. It's not the wrestling show you want. Just the wrestling show you need.